Good afternoon. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good afternoon. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good day and welcome to Advocacy Anywhere powered by American Jewish Committee. Advocacy Anywhere is AJC's digital platform that enables you to engage with AJC's global expertise, content, and advocacy from wherever you are. Less than a week ago, we saw a modern day pogrom take place in the streets of Amsterdam, reflecting a broader rise in anti-Semitic violence across Europe since October 7th. Joining us to discuss what happened, how we arrived at this point, and what it means for the future of Jews in Europe are Esther Foote, Editor-in-Chief of the Dutch Jewish Weekly, and Simone Rodan Benzaken, Managing Director of AJC Europe. Moderating our conversation is Director of the AJC Transatlantic Institute, Daniel Schwamenthal. After we hear from our guests, time permitting, we will take your questions. You may email your questions to questions at ajc.org, questions is plural, or you can use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Claire. Thank you to our audience and special thanks to Esther and Simon for joining us here today. The October 7 massacres launched not only a year-long seven-front war against Israel, but also a global war against the Jewish people. Last Thursday, we've reached uh, the so far lowest point in this explosion of murderous anti-Semitism. In Amsterdam, one of the world's most modern and liberal cities, we witnessed, often live streamed by the perpetrators, as on October 7, organized mass violence against Jews. We saw images that until last week, we knew only from the history books about Tsarist Russia or those black and white photos from Berlin in 1938. And in a cruel historic coincidence, this football match and hunt for Jews in Amsterdam took place on the very eve of the Dutch commemoration of the Nazi November pogroms. And just like in all of history's other pogroms, after the violence of the thugs came the denial of the pseudo-intellectual enablers. Many in the media, academia, and politics quickly contextualized the violence, denied any real anti-Semitic motive, and ultimately blamed the victims for provoking their attackers in the first place. History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Mark Twain is supposed to have quipped. When it comes to anti-Semitism, history seems to be uh, seems to prefer straightforward carbon copies. And with that, I would like to turn to you, Esther. Thank you again for being with us. Tell us a little bit about how uh, the current atmosphere is uh, among the Dutch Jewish community. And if you would also perhaps touch upon some of the other events that happened just this year that, that have shocked the community. Okay, well, right now, we really see uh, with the Jewish community that finally a broad majority says enough is enough. Because this is not a, an incident standing on its own. We had on the 10th of March here in Amsterdam the opening of the Holocaust Museum with a beautiful uh, get together in the Portuguese, the world famous Portuguese synagogue. And the town council allowed uh, in that synagogue to get very aggressive, fanatic, pro-Palestinian uh, protesters to come so near that even the king couldn't be heard inside the uh, synagogue because they were screaming so loud. Um, victims of the Holocaust and their great-grandchildren had to walk by these fanatic protesters. There's a world-famous photo that tells the whole story, and you can find that on the internet. Then, on, then uh, besides all the horrible things that went on on our campuses in America, you know everything about that. On the 7th of October, there was this commemoration on the Dump Square, a uh, commemoration for the victims of in the Kibbutzim and uh, in Israel of the 7th of October. Again, the mayor allowed uh, protesters to come so close that the, uh, uh, the, com the people who wanted to commemorate this, um, uh, uh, who were carrying Israeli flags, uh, were uh, visu uh, physically abused, uh, their, their flags were taken away, and even on the Dam Square itself, somebody went in and put uh, a tan of red uh, paint 
as mm. blood on the Israeli flag. This is the third time, the third time, besides everything that's happening in the stations with sit-ins and so on and so forth, that uh, things really escalated. And uh, we are fed up over here. We have seen enough about beautiful words from the mayor, like, I want to embrace you. Uh, I want to uh, uh, stand with you. But there are also a lot of people angry about Gaza. Well, that, that is of a hypocritical mentality that uh, really doesn't, doesn't fly anymore over here. Well, that's that's contextualizing it again. There, there was an important story that that you broke not too too far uh, not too long ago about about the police. Maybe you can yeah. touch upon this quickly. Yes, it was short before Rosh Hashanah. Uh, two of the wonderful they did great work. Uh, chairs of the Jewish police network were um, retiring. And they sat here at my kitchen table and they opened up. They really opened up. They told about colleagues that uh, were reluctant to defend synagogues. They told about colleagues that were pro-Palestinian and uh, that, that were... So what the police did was change their um, work hours so they didn't have to defend them. Uh, the, the, the synagogues or whatever, uh, schools and so on. And um, that a lot of their colleagues were either shy or reluctant to act during demonstrations. Now, this interview went viral, went really viral. They were also in a discussion about whether police agents should be able to wear a headscarf. Uh, because political correct uh, people who wanted to sell that to the Dutch public uh, said, yes, uh, it's not about only about headscarves, it's also about kibbot. And the whole Jewish uh, uh, organization within the police said, what? We never asked about that. It's not an issue with us. We are just being brought in to make it politically correct. So this is what's going on, and uh, it's uh, there's there's a lot to do over here. Yeah, I can I can imagine. Um, now, um, again, and people are immediately trying to to change the the narrative here, reverse victims and and perpetrators, and there's been some uh, conflicting messages. Can you, I mean, people I assume on this call know the basic outline of what happened in, uh, in Amsterdam, but can you uh, perhaps just like address some of the uh, distortions, uh, if not out, outright misinformation that has been spread about uh, uh, these events? Well, of course, the Israeli supporters of Maccabi Tel Aviv were hooligans. They in uh, what you see is that they intimidated taxi drivers. There was even a film without any uh, sound uh, that was shared for four hundred twenty thousand times uh, with the explanation that a taxi driver from Uber, yes, was uh, 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 was molested by Israelis. When you hear the sound, you hear it's exactly the other way around. Um, what didn't do well, and we have to say that were the choirs uh, of the Israeli Maccabi Tel Aviv hardcore supporters. But we have seen such a lot of that also uh, against Jews, like Jews to the Hamas, Hamas, Jews to the gas, gas. Um, uh, Jews burn the best. This is happening also in Dutch sports. These are songs in Dutch sport. And uh, we have been fighting to get them out of the stadiums for years without a lot of support from uh, the media. And now suddenly this uh, horrible, let's put it that way, uh, horrible sound from the Maccabi Tel Aviv fans is world news and that's how they change the narrative the jews put it on themselves because of these choirs 
because of taking a Palestinian flag somewhere from a house, while exactly at that moment it happened somewhere else in Amsterdam, and it's been happening all year that Israeli flags were taken off that way, often with fireworks. Nobody bothered, nobody bothered. So they are using and enlarging these incidents to say, you see, uh, the Maccabi Tel Aviv fans brought it upon themselves. Mm. Um, how has the government uh, reacted so far? And maybe you can speak briefly uh, about the makeup um, of this coalition and, 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 and compare it perhaps for our audience with um, the, the mayor of Amsterdam and, and, and the city council here. Well, uh, two things. Right now, the debate is going on in uh, Parliament. Okay. And since a lot, we have never had a more, more pro Israeli, more pro Jewish government than we have right now. It consists of the NSC, that's a new party, that's the most left wing party of the coalition. We have the BBB, which is uh, also a new party and um, is doing great. Is doing sort of great. a farmer's party, right? The, uh, uh, civilians and Farmers Party. Mm. Uh, and then we have the PVD, uh, which has always been standing strong against anti-Semitism. And of course, we have the PVP of Geert Wilders, who became the largest party in the last uh, uh, elections. Everybody was very surprised. The elections were on the 22nd of November last year. And I already said, well, you know, what happened on the 7th of October and the aggression in the streets afterwards will give uh, um, uh, Geert Wilders a lot of votes. What you have to see is that on the 7th of October 2023, uh, he had 17 seats in, uh, the, the, in Parliament. The 22nd of November, he had 35 seats, streets, seats in Parliament. And everybody is saying, yes, because he did so well during debates. No, because everybody saw what happened in the streets. And a lot of Dutch don't want the aggression and the fanat fanatism that we saw in the streets here since the 7th of October last year. Now, this is completely different from the Republic Amsterdam, very left wing, um, uh, very woke, very, very woke. And they have a very left-wing town council with a left-wing mayor who uh, are really doing everything possible to put it on the carpet. Hmm. Very quickly, before I uh, turn to uh, Simone, um, what was the role of social media in, uh, in, in these riots? They were horrible, and this is a huge problem here in the Netherlands. Um, uh, people are acting, they are able to um, concentrate in a short period of time, a lot of people. And there's another thing that is really bothering here in the Netherlands. There is a horrible uh, Instagram account that's called Set Mokro, uh, by, uh, Amer uh, Nate, uh, by Net Dutch that came from Moroccan descent, they are really indoctrinating uh, young Dutch people. Uh, they have 1.1 million followers. We have a population of 17 million, yes? 1.1 million followers, especially those of Moroccan descent, the ones who were attacking the Israelis on Thursday night. And they also drag in a lot of people who, sorry, a lot of people who are not of Moroccan descent, but who are friends with Moroccans. So it's spreading out like wildfire. And they are hugely uh, biased. They are demo demonizing Israel and they don't moderate their reactions. So... Uh, that Hitler didn't finish his job and they wished Hitler, Hitler would come back is all over the place and nothing is happening. And they are um, uh, they are building up. 
they you know th this is what is happening when it, it's not being put down uh people uh, ignite themselves how do you say in english i'm sorry i lost the word inside them inside them exactly yeah. exactly yeah. so that's what's happening and mm. uh, the the people from the justice system don't say, see what kind of horrible influence this telegram account has mm. so uh, we're chasing you know it's it's horrible I understand uh, let me turn to to Simon. Um, what has happened in in Amsterdam shook obviously all of Europe, and not least because I think most leaders know that these shocking scenes could quite easily repeat themselves in the streets of Paris, Brussels, or Berlin. Uh, we know the perpetrators came predominantly, if not exclusively, from the Muslim community, mostly people of Moroccan background, as far as we know. Um, you've been really um, at center stage of 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 of, of uh, this challenge. Can can you describe to our audience this problem that that again is not just the Dutch problem that so many Western European societies are facing as well? Uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, absolutely, um, everything that uh, Esther just described could be applied and reapplied to most Western European countries. Um, the reality is over the past at least 20 years, uh, Europe has been, or at least Western Europe has been dealing with what we called contemporary new form of anti-Semitism that is greatly linked uh, to um, a Muslim anti-Semitism that has arisen uh, to specifically an Islamist problem that we have in much of Western Europe. Uh, let's not forget that we've had anti-Semitic um, attacks, murders, that have happened over the past decade. The first one happened in 2012, uh, where children in school of Toulouse were killed uh, by Islamists. But even before that, even before in 2003 and 2006, Ilan Halimi were all killed, um, unfortunately, by one way, shape or form, radicalized uh, Muslims here on the ground. We've had the attacks in, in Belgium, of course, uh, in the Jewish Museum. We've had the attacks in Copenhagen. Um, and we've had a huge wave here in France, of course, of anti-Semitic terrorist attacks. Um, we've also had terrorist attacks that were then obviously uh, because that's how it always happens with anti-Semitism, um, uh, then affected the rest of society. Um, so Europe has, Western Europe has a big problem. Uh, much of it is, we could take, you know, this could take uh, more or less two hours, but much of it has to do with problems of integration, uh, with problems of parallel societies, uh, with problem of uh, foreign financing that have happened over the past yeah. really few decades, yeah. uh, where foreign countries have um, sent money um, to, to really pervert um, Muslim communities here on the ground, radicalized Muslim communities here on the ground. Um, and and um, for many, many years with not a lot of counteraction, uh, a sort of sense of passive passiveness or, or apathy uh, from many European governments. Uh, it took uh, many of European go governments a while to at least somehow awaken to a reality. Uh, but, uh, you know, that is somehow um the the answers have not been enough clearly um they're the 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 countries that are effective uh, affected now are more and more we, again we spoke about the Netherlands but you, in this you can of course um, include Belgium you can without any doubt conclude uh France the United Kingdom there are so many Western European countries that are all affected by 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 that problem um and it's not going anywhere and we with it, if I may just add, um, Esther spoke about what happened with the the mayor uh, and the city council. Uh, the um, the lack of reaction, or sometimes even worse, the instrumentalization or political clientelism by politicians, particularly coming from the far left, uh, over years and years and years, uh, either supporting, wor working hand in hand, being supported by Islamist organizations on the ground, financing some sometimes um, uh, Muslim organizations that are extremely problematic. It's something that, again, we have seen for at least a decade. Um, and, and again, um, this is very, very, very concretely endangering 
Jews on the European continent. Here, here, here. Right. I just want to add the whole woke community here in the Netherlands and the left wing community, especially the media, and we have a lot of them, they are allowing uh, this to happen and they are uh, building excuses mm. for these anti Semitic attacks because it's all because of Israel. And as long as Jews don't take the distance from Israel, this will happen to us. And it's a very common, huge problem here in the Netherlands that we're not mm. only fighting the, the, these, uh, this part of the Moroccan community that is completely lost, that doesn't want to integrate. Everybody's talking right now about integration. Well, they don't want to integrate. And, and uh, a lot of Western um, uh, academia that, uh, that, that says it's, yeah, rightfully so. Yeah, rightfully so. We completely understand. So this is really a problem because it's a conxy that is very hard to, to tackle, to yeah. very hard to tackle. And let me this just, comment, just sorry, let sure. me just add one tiny little thing, um, because I don't want our audience to under to believe that this is, you know, the entire Muslim community here on the ground. No, no, those no. who are though some of our biggest allies, some of our those who are the, the they are under even bigger threat sometimes than uh, than the, than the Jewish community are the Muslim courageous voices that are speaking out. Imam Khal Gumi. They are they are most of them are under police protection. Yes. Uh, the, all those who are speaking out for European values against Islamist extremism, again, what is going on in their own in, in their own communities, are all under police protection. Yes. So it, this is not it, it, this is this is this is this is not something um, that first of all affects only Jews. It affects Europe. It affects Europe's values. It affects European society, um, and it and and also it it it. It endangers those in the Muslim community that uh, that are that are that want to be part of the larger European society, and it endangers therefore the fabric of the very idea of what our societies are about. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to uh, to point out that what you said earlier, Esther, that this comment that as long as the Jews do not sub, um, distance themselves from Israel, that this is what. As you told me earlier, a, a a political commentator said on television, right? And he's a, quite a popular figure. Yes, that's uh, yeah. Martin van Rossum. He did that already before the seventh of October, but he's not the only one. The thing yeah, is that but... he is so popular. Right. He's very popular, and people love him. He's a good historian, but mm -hmm. where it comes to Israel, he goes completely yeah. wrong, uh, also factual wrong. Yeah. And um, uh, it's very hard to tackle him because he's he is this Mr. Van Rossum. And yeah. we've got but more it's... people like that. We've got more people like that who only have their focus on Israel. There's another mm. uh, right wing, actually, commentary uh, that's called uh, uh, Johan Derksen. He is very popular amongst right wing uh, uh, viewers, uh, the television viewers. And the first thing he said after 7th of October uh, is, well, actually, the Jews owe it a little bit to themselves. The Jews, yes. Of course, he was attacked about it. He's still on television. He did, still mm. didn't apologize. And uh, and uh, after that, he also invited left-wing comment commentaries who, uh, who completely go in that narrative, uh, who often do that just for mm. the money, I have to say, just for the money, uh, because they move from right wing to left wing, because now they are allowed to go on national television and there they can uh, ask for a fee. I'm sorry, I'm very cynical, but I saw it happening. And uh, so it's all over the board and it's very, very, very hard to tackle this. Right, right. Um, now, uh, Simon, you, you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the, the various terror attacks against Jews and, and, and murders. So um, is there anything uh, the rest of Europe can can learn from the French experience and maybe also from French political reaction to to uh, to uh, to this problem? 
So first of all, um, France has been slow. Um, it was slow to wake up the, to the reality. And I think if it hadn't been so slow, we wouldn't have seen what happened in particular uh, in the year in, in 2012, 15, 14, 16, um, uh, the, the, and, and that continues to be. Um, it was slow, but I have to say, uh, yeah, I think there are things that are um, that have changed and there are counter movements um, that have been produced. Um, there is, uh, first of all, um, there are some uh, courageous, as I mentioned, there are some courageous voices, uh, more and more that we see uh, in the French public debate, uh, whether um, it's specifically speaking out against Islamic extremism, um, or frankly also about, um, uh, and it often goes hand in hand, uh, about the distortion that is being made uh, about, uh, about Israel, about the criminalization of Israel, uh, about um, the, the, the demonization of Israel, uh, um, there are courageous voices, um, but there is also uh, the French government um, under this uh, president, Emmanuel Macron, under the previous uh, president, in particular, Prime Minister Emmanuel Valls, who has made, uh, have made progresses. Um, one of it is uh, what is um, the, what is was called the anti-separatism uh, law that was uh, voted by the French uh, parliament and that was proposed by the president, um, in which um, the idea is that more than just fighting against terrorism, they have to, we have to fight, the society, the government has to fight also against uh, the parallel societies that are being created. And in particular, the Islamist ideolo the ideology that is being, has been promoted, as I said earlier on, for too long. So one of the things, for example, it does is that um, it, um, now, uh, um, there was zero transparency, for example, of any foreign funding up until then. Uh, you could be a, 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 a country or a more or less foundation linked to a terrorist organization wanting to give money to a mosque or to an organization. You could do so without a problem and no one would know about it. So one of the things that was done in this anti-separatism law is now that any dollar, any euro that is being sent from a foreign government or for a foreign entity <coughs> needs to be needs to be um, um, declared uh, publicly. So they have to they have to um, publish their accounts. If they don't, there will be a procedure to shut it down. Uh, the other thing is that, for example, homeschooling, one of the big problems that we've had is um, that some of the kids uh, had been homeschooled in small groups and um, that uh, radical Islamist uh, teachers uh, were teaching them at home. Um, that has been tightened immensely and it's merely impossible um, at this stage. Um, and the other thing is the whole idea of protecting laïcité, uh, sec French secularism, which means that uh, you, you probably know about the, the fact that in French schools you cannot wear any religious symbols, uh, because the idea is to say that this space, the school, is a space where, where kids need to be protected. So it has been extended, uh, including also to organizations, so there can be no public funding, for example, um, given to any organization, to any institution, um, non-governmental organization, uh, whatever, that uh, doesn't um, uh, uh, that doesn't uh, promote the idea of the separation of uh, of religion uh, and um, and 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 school and and any anything public. Um, so there has again been pro progress been made. I don't think it's going to be enough, but I think it serves as an aspiration and as an mm. inspiration and should serve as an inspiration for many other European countries, particularly Western European countries, uh, where this pro where this problem um, exists. I know that there are currently thinking on the on the French side, particularly since what happened in Amsterdam, to try and push some of this agenda on the European uh, on the European agenda. Well. Um, let me ask both of you, um, and maybe we start with 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 Esther. Some of your, you know, top policy recommendations uh, you would have to uh, Dutch and European policymakers right now. Esther, what what is the top of your list? Well, here in the Netherlands, it's very clear. This is not only an integration crisis. This is also a crisis of authority. 
and uh, this has been going on for a long time. We are known to be very tolerant, and the other side of the coin of being tolerant is being coward. Mm. And this is what we see here in the Netherlands. Uh, a lot of people are getting away with thing with um, uh, uh, not holding on the law, uh, with uh, be deeds against the law, and there are no consequences. This is even so that last week after Thursday, this left-wing mayor said, "Okay." This is a state of emergency. We do not allow any demonstrations until coming Thursday, until tomorrow. On Sunday, um, then uh, the, a group of uh, pro-Palestinian protest, pre protesters went to court, to the quick court, and the court said, no, it's not allowed. It's too dangerous. The town is too overheated. They went anyway. They went to the Dam Square here in Amsterdam anyway. And the police took them away. And instead of finding them or whatever, they put them in buses and they brought them to the uh, to a part of uh, the, the a suburb of town and they let them go again. Yes. So nothing happened. They were not nothing reprimanded. Happened. Nothing were, happened. Not, nothing not happened. Fine. They were just, you know, sightseeing Amsterdam. Sightseeing Amsterdam in a bus. Now, this is the problem. If you would find those people with 1,000 euro, they wouldn't do it again. But they know they get away with it. So they go and stand on the dumb square anyway. Hmm. And this is just a, a small example of last Sunday. But this is happening all over the place. One of the most prominent protesters during protesters during March, 10 March, the 10th of March, during the opening of the Holocaust Museum, and also later on the Dam Square, where we have films of him kicking and screaming against uh, the police, and he did a lot of other things. Yes, also on the universities and whatever. We know his name. We know how he looks. He was standing on the top of police cars during the opening on 10th of the 10th of March he went to court so he was sued he was he was sued oh, he yeah, was arrested he was, sued. Or... he was sued he went to court he acknowledged what he had done and they released him because of lack of ev evidence can you imagine what? He, he, he acknowledged he... what he did he acknowledged what he did and they let him go as lack of because of lack of evidence. And this is what is happening right now in the Netherlands. And that's why I say it's not only an integration crisis, mm. it's also uh, uh, the rule of law is so far, so far bounded, don't rock the boat, don't rock mm. the boat, that people are letting go well, as small children, with all due respect, there should be a parent who says, from here and no further. And it doesn't right. happen. So it's expense. It's like an octopus. Mm. Mm. So, the, so many of the legislations are in place, but they are not properly implemented or, exactly. or, or lack They're judges just let them go. They're not I, 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 before I turn to Simone, I just, because I don't know if you are even aware, but I just saw that on the news that Apparently, the government said that um, they consider this as a terror attack. And therefore, if uh, they can catch these people and convict them, and they have dual nationality, that they can uh, with uh, they can lose their Dutch nationality. There is uh, a law. Yeah, there's an article 83, I think, uh, uh, that uh, we also looked at with ISIS um travelers mm -hmm. uh i think that would be in the most extreme uh, moment because these people also have a dutch nationality offered to they have moroccan and dutch na nationality yeah of course you can only do this if they have a dual national if they still have you cannot yeah, but we already yeah. tried that oh, there was already tried to bring uh criminal moroccans back to morocco mm -hmm. and morocco refuses to accept them uh, so um, 
I see a lot of practical problems. Hmm. And it looks good, uh, yeah. but I don't see it really happening. I really don't yeah. see it happening. Right. But Simon, he did say it. Yeah. He did Sorry. say it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Simon, uh, what is on your wish list? Uh, my wish list is very long. Um, but uh, but yeah, first of all, um, I entirely agree. And AJC has been calling for a zero tolerance strategy for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, and first of all, because we know it works. We know it works. It's what uh, the, the mayor of New York did with the broken window theory, cleaning up criminality in New York decades ago. Um, and we know that it works. We also know it from here, by the way, in France, when uh, France decided at the very early beginning of after October 7th to ban anti, anti-Israel demonstrations. And I'm saying specifically anti-Israel demonstrations and not pro-Palestinian demonstrations. But after October 7th, to ban anti-Israel demonstrations uh, because there was a risk of security to, to French Jews, it had an immediate effect. It had an immediate effect because for weeks, even for months and months and months, there was nothing. Nothing happened. There were no tr- people didn't try and commit crimes. Didn't didn't pr- try and 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 do 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 further public damage in the streets of, of Paris. While so many other countries were affected about that. Uh, the same goes for universities. When we had demonstrations and people were destroying public property, when people prevented French Jews from going on campus, uh, the police acted very very swiftly, um, and it had its effect. So we know that it works. Um, but not enough is done. People are not sufficiently prosecuted, uh, nevertheless. And more than not just sufficiently prosecuted, I would say it's also really important that even small anti-Semitic hate crimes are being communicated a bit, uh, yeah. about. Because it sends a message to the rest of society that there are limits, that there, there are things that are criminal, that there are things that are not criminal, and that when you, when you commit a crime, that there are consequences in our society. It's absolutely crucial. The second thing I would say, and we haven't spoken about this here together so much, but it's the link between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Mm-hmm. For too long, uh, first of all, most European countries have adopted the working definition. Many European countries have spoken about the link of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, yet there are no real conclusion to those words. Mm-hmm. When we have European leaders European political leaders that demonize, criminalize, uh, dehumanize uh, Israelis, Zionists, and frankly, Jews, there are no consequences to that. Um, so, um, So I think there needs to be some very, very thorough thinking about how we address from a policy perspective uh, the issue of anti-Zionist anti-Semitism. It's absolutely crucial uh, because, again, the words are there. Angela Merkel said it, Manuel Valls said it, uh, President Macron said it, but there is not much that how it translates into very concrete action. One of this concrete action can also be in terms of education. Most European schools deal with Holocaust education. But how many European students learn about Zionism learn about the, uh, the, 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 the identity of Israel, learn about the fact that Zionism was a liberation movement yeah. uh, and not racism and not colonialism. Exactly, um, colonialism, so I think, yeah. So I think there needs to be much more done uh, on that respect. And then lastly, I think we absolutely have to connect it, the issue, as we said during our entire conversation, to the issue of, of Islamism. Um, there is a tendency in our systems sometimes to separate the topics. Of course, anti-Semitism is linked to the issue of Islamism. And I think we have to connect the dots. We have to do more. And we have to do more in particular on a European level. It's great if France does something. It's great if now there will be new legislation in the Netherlands. But if we don't do something in in those countries, in particular in Western country, in Western Europe, that deal with the same issues. Um, I think we will continue to deal be dealing with the same problems because 
um, there will be solutions found by our enemies. Uh, to, to you know, we live in a European wider society. Everything is open. It's open borders. Um, so unless we we are also collectively uh, deal with this yeah. as a European problem, I think there will be limits in our in our response to it. And that's Many very thanks. hard to do with, for example, Spain right now. Absolutely. Um, this yeah. is perfect timing. This is exactly where I was supposed to hand it over to, to Claire uh, for questions uh, from our audience. That's what happens when you have two German and one Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Daniel. Um, our first question is for you, Esther. BJ Hoffman is asking, while the right wing in Dutch politics, currently led by Gert Wielders, has been supportive of the Jewish community and opposed to anti-Semitism, do we remain wary of the anti-Semitism that has been historically espoused from his party, or is it less of an issue given immediate threats? Listen, there is no historical anti-Semitism within Geert Wilder's party. Uh, I know maybe he means that um, his uh, second in command, who is now the chair of parliament, uh, Hans Bosma, uh, once said something uh, about about Hungary, but um, that was really not intended. Um, if anywhere you can attack Geert Wilders and the PVV, it's on discrimination towards Muslims, and that doesn't really help the case, to be very honest. But uh, uh, it, within Parliament, within Geert Wilders' party, Hans Bosma even uh, congratulated our magazine, our Jewish magazine, when we existed for 150 years, in fluent Ivrit. Yes, in fluent Hebrew. Um, they are really very, uh, very pro-Israel. And you really can't say that the PVV is... Uh, uh, anti-Semitic. That's something maybe, they are not. Maybe it's important to point out that unlike other sort of populist right-wing parties who very often have their roots in neo-Nazi parties yeah, no, that then not here. became not more, here. more, you know, a mainstream, uh, Geert Wilders used to be in the VVD, which is a libertarian, you know, socially not, um, liberal, economically economically uh, free market party. Yeah, we have us, a right? very, very strange uh, very, but, political, but, but, he doesn't, yeah, but they, they have always been, yeah. they have always been uh, pro-Israel and uh, Geert Wilde stepped out of it. He lived in Kibbutzim, he, um, he was in the Kibbutz, he has Israeli friends, um, Hans Bosma, his second in command, uh, who is now the chair of parliament, he was uh, also, he, spe he speaks fluent Hebrew. He was in Ulpan. So please, let's not uh, put the PVV in the anti-Semitic corner like maybe you can do from other European uh, par uh, uh, parties. You, can't say, you really can't say that about the PVV. You can have a lot of criticism on the PVV, but not that they're, they're anti-Semitic. Bullshit. Our next question is for you, Simone, from Roger Barton, who's asking, what's happening in Europe is certainly concerning. What lessons should America be learning from what happened as we deal with our own issues of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism? Um, I've, I've written, I've said a lot about this for the past decade. Um, but uh, first of all, I think the most important uh, thing is, uh, is no complacency. Uh, and even when the anti-Semitism comes from parts with, of, of society where it's difficult to address, one of the big problems I think we've had um, in Europe over the past and over the past, really over the first decade when it really had exploded the anti-Semitism is that the anti-Semitism was coming from parts of society, of, from people who come from minority groups and without a doubt suffer themselves from discrimina discrimination and racism. 
And so one of the problems I think was that for a very long time there was a tendency not to not to not to address that because people didn't want to stigmatize a community that itself was uh, was already uh, suffering. Um, the uh, the same thing I think goes with the fact that um, anti-Semitism comes from different parts of society, um, and so uh, while the left saw itself for a very long time as being you know tolerant and anti-racist. Um, uh, they they were at the same time, or at least parts of the left, or parts of the extreme left, um, were 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 already um, 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 you know discriminating on having views and and promoting views of of the Jewish community that were very problematic. But for a very very long time, it was difficult to address uh, because again um, um, it 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 came only from one front, and that I think is is the other aspect is that. I, it's absolutely important, I think, to allow any politician to be able to play political ball game with the issue of anti-Semitism. Um, if the if the left is only capable of addressing the anti-Semitism coming from the far right, uh, then they're not very serious about dealing with anti-Semitism. When the far right is or the right is uh, only looking at the anti-Semitism coming from the other camp um, and not at all admitting that something might be going on within their own camp, um, then I think we, uh, have, uh, we have a problem and they're not really serious about anti-Semitism. Um, the other thing I think, and uh, again, Esther and I and Daniel have both have, have spoken about it, is the need for a zero tolerance strategy. When I look at what happened in the United States, on campuses, uh, in the yeah. streets of 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 you know New York, Los Angeles, uh, you name it. Um, it's I I we, there is of course um, freedom of expression and freedom of to assemble, but this goes far 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 beyond this. Uh, the issue of foreign financing, the issue of when you know that certain universities, that certain sections and organizations are being funded by organ by by countries or by organizations from outside of the United States. That, that seek to undermine not only uh, uh, not only threaten directly Jews, but frankly th threaten the fabric of American society, uh, and and are profoundly trying to tear apart. Um, the, the the very idea of what it is to to be America, um, then I think they need to be fought, and we need to be extremely, or you need to be extremely strict in how to address it. Here, here, Esther. Yes, our next question is for you. Um, several on Zoom are asking for clarity about whether there was reluctance to act immediately from the police or from the mayor. Is that the case? And if so, what kind of changes need to be made to prevent future reluctance and ensure that Jews and others can get the help they need? Okay, I don't think there was a uh, real reluctance. I think that the mayor underestimated the threat while they were warned from Israel, from other parts in society, they were they were underestimating the threat, and I really don't want to say that you can blame the 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 policemen in the street. They were overwhelmed, and it, they were hit and run attacks. So as soon as the police were there, the 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 attackers were already gone, and still also it needs to be. Um, it needs to be researched. I don't dare to say anything else about that. So uh, uh, this is something. It is about the town council and what we call the triangle, isn't that cynical? The triangle of the justice department, uh, the police and the mayor who underestimated the risks and who didn't see, while well, there were warnings because I saw the warnings before it happened uh, on, on, on Telegram and app accounts, uh, they, just, they just didn't respond quick enough. And um, uh, for example, uh, what, what you saw happening was that the hardcore uh, hooligan kind supporters of Maccabi Tel Aviv were ta being taken away immediately from the stadium, where it had been a huge party, by the way, even the speaker said, well, thank you so much for a wonderful 
a sporty night and whatever, they were taken away to their uh, hotels. So what you ended up with in the city of Amsterdam were real supporters. So uh, this all needs to be researched. I don't want to speculate. I don't want to speculate. But I do not think that right then and there, uh, police were really saying, okay, let it go because I don't, I, I don't want to go that far. Maybe I'm naive, but I don't want to go that far. Thank you. Simone, the next question is for you from Todd Croner, who's saying Israel's football slash soccer team is playing France um, in Paris tomorrow. In view of last week's events, what precautions is the French government taking specifically for this event or more generally to protect the Jewish population? Yeah, this is a this is a big, big, big story. Wow. Uh, a big story. <laughs> For the past few days, so um, Israel will indeed be playing uh, the French national team. Um, I will. I tomorrow. Uh, I, tomorrow, I have been invited wow. um, to to attend, um, in, uh, um, and I will uh, attend uh, the match. There have been a lot of conversations and discussions and pushed by different, uh, especially the far left parties, uh, Mélenchon's party, to try and get the match cancelled. Uh, there have also been ca calls. Uh, just as this, by the way, it was the case with the Olympics. Um, so they are a habit of doing this, um, not for security reasons, of course. Uh, be, um, um, and there have been calls of others more on security reasons to say, as to say, this match should be taking place elsewhere. Um, the president has made it very clear, and the prime minister that there that the match will be taking place. Uh, that not doing so would mean mm -hmm. bowing to uh, intimidation. Uh, and terrorism. Um, and so the match will be taking place. Usually a foot match like this, there will be a hundred, should be a hundred thousand um, uh, spectators in the, in the hall. Uh, it has been re reduced to 20,000. Uh, in order to be able to deal with, from a security perspective, um, there will be uh, more than 4,000 policemen in the streets uh, and protecting um, the game. Of course, uh, zero risk is impossible, but the state has been extremely, extremely clear that they're entirely committed in making sure that every single supporter, every individual um, is protected um, um, in the this game, the president himself, and this I think is very important, um, is this has decided to attend the game. So is the previous president, Nicolas Sarkozy, and the previous president, François Hollande, uh, and members of the opposition and members of the government. So in sort of a clear uh, show Message. of support yep. uh, that Israeli uh, uh, players are welcome. Uh, and that this match absolutely needs to take place. So it's very, very, very important and very uh, a positive response, I believe, uh, from most of the political pl class, and in particular the French government. Will, will there be Israeli supporters? Well, the, oh, the Israeli... The I can see that there is a journalist speaking to me. <laughs> so, no, I'm very curious, sorry. I know, I know. Um, no, so, this yes, is news to me. This is news to me. <laughs> so um, the Israeli uh, government has um, has recommended for um, for Israeli supporters not to attend the game. Uh, okay. But from what I understand, uh, there will nevertheless be Israeli supporters who will be present. And I know that there will be a big, big show from the French Jewish community. Wow, curious, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> I'll just combine the last two questions, so just bear with me. Uh, the first from Jamie Frazier. I know this is a question that's been asked for many years, and in light of the recent attack in Amsterdam, it is once again at the forefront of many people's minds. Given the ongoing concerns about anti-Semitism and security of Jewish communities, what would you say to those who question the viability of Jewish life in Europe? And that's the first question. The second um, is, after this terrible attack, what opportunities are there for stronger collaboration? How might it bring European countries, the U.S., and others around the world together to fight anti-Semitism? And could it also encourage partnerships beyond just government efforts? And so it's a lot of questions. Um, let me Whoa. take a, a first stab at that. Um, and also maybe Daniel can, can jump in um, um, to answer that. Um, 
first of all, um, there, I, I believe uh, that since October 7th, um, there, the response of uh, European governments has, not, has been not sufficient. Um, in there have of course been a lot of things that have been done in terms of security, in terms of statements. But overall, when you look at the increase of anti-Semitism across the European continent, we can see, we can witness an explosion. Uh, we've had a thousand percent increase in in France. We've had. Uh, Six, nearly 600% in the United Kingdom. We've had, uh, I think, uh, nearly 250% in the Netherlands. We've had um, increase in Germany, in Belgium. We've had it everywhere. And it sometimes feels like most of the times we are commenting um, um, uh, an inevitable uh, surge or explosion of anti-Semitism. Um, and what I would hope for, and that goes to the idea of stronger collaboration, what I would hope for is there that there is an all government um, uh, initiative um, to see what in this um, emergency that we are dealing with can be done to protect uh, European Jewish life. Um, and that brings me to the, 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 the first question, um, the issue of viability. Uh, listen, I believe, and I always have believed, um, that um, that um, the diaspora community is uh, is very important, and then in particular, the European Jewish community is is vital. Uh, it's vital for the fabrics of our society. It's vital for um, the promise that was made, frankly, after the Second World War, uh, not only to European Jews, but to Europe and the world as such. Uh, we know that anti-Semitism is always the, the, the cannery in the coal mine and the symbol of a, of a society falling apart. If Jews were to leave the European continent entirely, I think it would be the end of Europe. Um, that being said, European Jews are afraid. I don't know any European Jew, Jew, Jewish family who doesn't ask themselves the question whether they have a future here. Um, the European Jews have to hide their identities. We know it from our surveys um, that we have done in France, but also in Germany. But in particular, since October 7th, that Jews are hiding their identity, that they are hiding their names on what's on, on apps, that they are taking off mezuzot of the mezuzot of the doors, that they are taking off yarmulkes in the streets, that they are telling their kids not, not, to, uh, not to reveal their Jewish identity in public, public schools. Um, so um, again, uh, my appeal is and has been and will be to European governments if they want to make sure that European Jews can continue to live here and that they want to protect the very values of the countries that they that were based on, then they absolutely have to take the level of 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 seriousness um, and 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 frankly do more. For me, there's not um, much to add. I can only second what uh, uh, Simone said. Um, there definitely is room uh, for cooperation. I'm, I, I met with the uh, Dutch uh, ambassador to the EU and suggested to him that this ought to be really brought to the uh, attention of the entire EU. And, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that that was already on their mind. And the Dutch foreign minister, um, the next regular meeting of ministers will be on Monday and it will be the ministers of foreign ministers. And so he will raise this issue, um, and not just as a Dutch problem, but a, um, a pan-European problem. And, and I really only re reiterate what we, what has said, been said before, uh, namely that um, you know there must be zero tolerance uh, uh, towards uh, um, anti-Semitism and so-called pro-Palestinian protests, which often uh, descent into simply demonization, vile anti-Semitic hate fests. Uh, there has been a, a, a term that has been made very popular in the UK is two-tier policing, that those um, uh, uh, protesters, when they are against Israel, are often allowed to breach the boundaries of the law, and then um, uh, yeah. pro-Israeli uh, supporters are treated uh, uh, very, very differently. Um, and uh, what we also really need, and that has been said before, really leading by examples. We have too many European uh, leaders who have been simply regurgitating uh, these vile, uh, libelous uh, accusations against the state of Israel. Um, and then, of course, it opens the door uh, for hatred uh, towards Jews in general. So this is also something that we at AJC are tackling and uh, uh, every day. I just want to, to comment on um, 
my a, a bit pessimistic view. Uh, it, what you see here in the Netherlands is there's there's a schism be, between being a good Jew and a bad Jew. You're a good Jew if you really distance yourself from Israel, and you're a bad Jew uh, when you say, hey, there are two sides of the story, then you're not being invited to any public program anymore. Uh, you are immediately a right-wing extremist, and uh, you are marginalized. And what I know is that the, the Jewish community uh, refuses to not well yes they have criticism they're criticizing the Israeli government but they refuse to distance themselves from the most basic Zionistic law and that already puts you in a camp uh, where everybody is looking like uh, 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 uh. if this is continuing and if only the peoples on the periphery of the Jewish community who is saying what media want to hear, like, oh, yes, here horrible, horrible Israel are the persons that are getting a podium in the media, then I really don't see on the long term a future. Because Israel is in our hearts and in our cores. And if we have to defy that in order to stay safe in Europe, then Thank you, but no thank you. All right. Uh, we have come to the end of our program. Uh, again, uh, thank you so much, particularly Esther uh, and Simone uh, for joining us. Thank you, Esther, for all the important work you're doing. And uh, I hope you and the Dutch community, they know they are not alone. Uh, we are standing shoulder to shoulder with you and fighting every day. Uh, with you um, and uh, as Simon said we uh, we the diaspora community is so important for Europe and we all will get through this uh, back to you Claire thank you Esther Simone and Daniel for today's timely and insightful conversation and thank you to our global audience for tuning in today to learn more about AJC's work countering anti-semitism and anti-zionism in Europe and around the world and to support our urgent work please visit ajc.org Thank you again and goodbye. Thank you.